I'll get out of here eventually. Truck started to overheat again. We'll hang out here for half an hour more or something, let it cool off a bit, and I'll just keep on doing this all the way out. <laughs> Pain in the ass. Whoops. All right. What do we got? Who needs to be heard? You're going to get heard. You're going to get heard right now. All right, here we go. Mark, this is red. This is titled The Sound of Silence. Good morning, Steve. My name is George Williams Sr., and you're more than welcome. You say my name. You asked recently about if anyone has ever had the sounds of the river go quiet. Yeah, I did, actually. Well, yes, but not in relationships with any Sabe, sabe con contacts that I've had, but more on our own lost gifts. Let me tell you some unique, unique experiences that I've had and the circumstances surrounding them. I think they may be a piece of the puzzle that we all need to know and are applicable to any Bigfoot encounters anyone else has. I'm a professional timber faller, but when I'm not slamming trees, I enjoy whitewater kayaking. When you paddle class four or five white water, you have to be focused in ways that most people don't have the opportunity to put themselves in. Mistakes can be uncomfortable. Panic can be costly. I've had the amazing experience of being so laser focused on what I was doing, making the right moves, placing my boat in the exact spot on the water that I have to be at, timing my paddle strokes. Many times it feels like time slows down, even though everything is happening in rapid succession. The noise of the river melts away into complete silence. I can see ever drop off water that splashes up. Everything is in slow motion. One time I and a friend were paddling in a very small volcanic bed creek. He was in front of me. We dropped a small waterfall that was about eight feet. And what we didn't see was a log wedge in the pour over, but two thirds of the way down. Ooh, my buddy's boat cleared it. Mine, however, did not. My boat rocked up onto the log and wedged me in the falls backwards, tail down. The falling water was pouring directly into my helmet, forming an air pocket, allowing me to, allowing me to be easily. Whatever that means. Oh, allowing me to be easily. Okay, I get it. I was unable to pull my spray skirt because it was wedged tight against the rocks on my left, and I was sitting with my legs straight up. My body right at the surface of the water, with my body right at the surface of the water. Only my head and shoulders were above water, except for the falls pounding on me. Oh, God. Okay, here's the weird part. After about three minutes, my partner hadn't come to help, and he stated later that he didn't know I was in trouble. I was starting to get really fatigued, and all of a sudden I could see, not out of my eyes, but in 360 degrees. I shit you not, Steve. I could see the water in front of me and beyond. I could see the rocks on both sides of me without turning my head. I could see the cliff wall that made the falls behind my head. It all looked like what you would see on TV when they try to depict what an image looks when bats use radar or whales use sonar, but much more clear. Crazy. I can't explain it or wrap my understanding around how it works, but there it was, and a calmness came over me. I had no fear of drowning, just had to figure out how to get out of my boat. I finally managed to rip my spray skirt off tearing it in the process, and then proceeded to try to slide out of my boat. I was in a jackknife position. My right knee became hyper-extended, hyper and was unable to get out while staying above water. It was now about seven or eight minutes stuck. Still no help from my boat partner. At this point, I decided that the only way out was down, getting more tired and ever sinking to the point that now the only thing about water was my face, the only thing above water was my face, and the falling water pounded on my helmet creating an ever-decreasing air pocket. I committed to the only exit I had left. All this time, I could still see in 360 degrees. So I let my body fall backwards and upside down, slid out of my boat, and instantly got slammed on the bottom of the creek. My body wrapped all around the stern of my boat, right at my left armpit. Oh, my body wrapped around the stern of my boat, right at my left armpit. With my eyes closed and all that churning, bubbling water under the falls, I still had this weird ability to see everything as if it was in broad daylight. Suddenly my right boot slipped off and a thought went through my head. If my shoe can go that way, so can I. 
So I relaxed, let my body melt around my boat, flushed out, and popped up about 15 feet downstream, with my boot floating in front of me when I hit the surface. At that point, my buddy was just rounding the rocks coming to look for me. The whole ordeal lasted maybe 10 minutes, but it felt like forever. Now to the point of the story where, why it may have been a puzzle piece. I personally believe that we have abilities that we've lost touch with, touch with. But sometimes something kicks our minds in gear. We become focused and our senses become awakened. And in those moments, we tap into our lost abilities. Call it your gut, sixth sense, pressure, or just a feeling. But I think it is the awakening of our abilities. I hope this helps someone. We are more than we know. And George, I absolutely agree. I've had a handful of experiences myself where I should be toast. <laughs> I can't believe I'm not. And uh, log jams have always given me the shivers. Any kind of a log jam in a river. I used to drift, drift numerous ri rivers for steelhead years ago and had a drift boat. And uh, I watched some guys. They were actually, actually they were drinking and smoking dope at like 8 in the morning up the river, going down a, a river in a drift boat. And they hit a huge log jam. And I could see them. I was anchored up well down river past the log jam, and I was anchored up with two guys. And I glanced back up, and I could already see the guy. It was too late for him. He had to start making his turn in time, and he didn't even know it yet. I had so much time before he even knew he was in danger that I told my friends. I said, we're probably going to see somebody die here in a second, so don't panic. And don't lunge for people when they start coming by. We'll see if we can save them. And that boat went clear you can see him panic, and then the drift boat went boom, slid sideways into the huge log jam, went upside down, and everything disappeared under logs. It was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. I don't know how they did it. I haven't a clue, but all three of those lucky bastards came up around the other side of the logs after a little bit, and they all lived, barely. But anyway, I'm guilty of it too. I went over Upper San Juan River springtime, you way too young, way too stupid, and flipped over in a canoe. Slammed up against the log jam, lost rifles, lost everything. And then it was a very, very long, freezing cold paddle. Got the boat paddle back and the canoe back and paddled. It took a handful, of, half a day to get back. But anyway, looking back to your experience, that's something else. Kicking, kicking in gear your natural abilities without a doubt. The slow motion thing's common. I've had slow motion happen in car accidents. I've had slow motion happen with grizzly bears about to chew on me. But slow motion happened in a few different things for myself too. It's weird. I think there actually is a term for it. A possible scientific term for that. Somebody will probably comment about it in the comment section. If or when this video makes it back to YouTube or not. Right now the audio from this will be on Spreaker. If you're hearing it today. But anyway, thanks George. For, thanks for sending that in. Appreciate it. I'm sure we'll help somebody or, or kick in some, some, kick a few brains into gear. And don't be shy about sending in whatever else you got, too. All right, George? Appreciate it, man. <clears throat> All right, what do we got here? There's another one with some kind of a photo. Mark, this is red. Dear Steve, thanks for sharing your life, interests, and concerns. I'm almost 65 years old, and I love to hike. I was out with my youngest grandson over the summer in New Lexington, Ohio, which sits in Perry County, Ohio. There's a tile manufacturer there called Ludowiki Roof Tile. They also sit next to Perry State Forest Loop Trail. However, this particular morning, my youngest grandson, grandson and I veered off the loop a short ways into the boggy area adjacent to one of the loops and found tracks, number one first, after which we walked back to the trail loop and found this track, number two. I would value your expertise on these tracks. Sincerely, Paul, Peter, Zirovnik. Okay, man. What do we got? I'm looking... I have a clue. Oh, that was actually to me from here. Looking right now, that just looks like two deer prints side by side to me. Possibly. I don't know. The sad thing is I'm not there. But then we got a weird indent below the right two toes, which doesn't fit at all. It looks like a heel coming this way to me. So you know what? Sorry. I apologize, but I'm, I'm not Paul. I'm not the guy right now. The second one looks, uh, it could be possibly abnormal too, but to be honest, it, it looks to me, man, it's a toughie. The, the curvature to the print below the toe-ish looking prints looks odd and it doesn't really match up with the toe prints. And the toe prints still look to me like deer prints coming this way, but I, maybe not. That's the frustrating thing about not being there and being able to see for myself or see different angles or a camera close to the ground scooting in on it, you know? 
So it's very tough for me to give a call on that, man. It's confusing to me. It doesn't stand out. Is there anything I'm familiar with for sure. Sorry if I didn't help at all. All right. Mark, this next one is red ripping along. Sharing more experiences and the importance of intuition. Oh, way too long. <laughs> this is a book. Oh, how long is this going to take? All right, I'm going for it. Let the truck cool off some more. Remember a man a while back about being picked up by a Sasquatch after he picked up a turtle? He wrote us again, and here it is. Was that me? Oh, okay. That is me. That I put that in there. Hmm. Hi, Steve. My name is John Blatt. Yes, of course I remember your name, John. You previously shared my face-to-face -face encounter when I was a child over a year ago. The one where I was picked up by the Sabe after I had picked up the turtle. Well, I have two more experiences that I'd like to share, and maybe they can add a piece to the puzzle for someone out there. Thank you for sharing my first encounter several times on your channel. That helped me a lot to be heard after all these years. I'm grateful, and it's been great to see your channel grow so much over the past year. The people want to be heard, and the bullshit needs to be stopped. You're providing an invaluable service to all of us in bringing more and more of the puzzle pieces of this life together. Keep up the great work, my friend. Thank you for the courage of words, man. Appreciate it. These two encounters are very strange. It's one of the reasons I have been so reluctant to share them. You'll see what I mean. My apologies in advance if this email becomes long. My Mount Rainier experience. This occurred in the spring of 2006 when I first moved here to the Pacific Northwest. My wife, young son, and myself had just moved to the area. We were trying to figure out where we wanted to live. We did a lot of camping the first few months. We were here, and we wanted to explore all the amazing places in the Puget Sound area. I really wanted to do some camping at Mount Rainier National Park, mostly because of my childhood Sasquatch experience. I'd read many encounters of these beings in and around the Mount Rainier area, and I knew they had a strong presence around the mountain. And at the time, I still had a very strong fear of them because of my childhood encounter and still consider myself an, an avid Bigfoot researcher. But I wanted to overcome my lifelong fear of them and to try to reach out and make contact. Yeah, not the greatest idea, I know, but I needed to overcome this obstacle in my life. I still periodically had nightmares with the Sabe, and I truly wanted to be alone with them. Be done with them, sorry. You know, side note, you guys, there is a piss load of people have gone missing around Mount Rainier. Google it up. Search it up, I mean. I'd always felt that at least some of these beings had psychic abilities, and after years and years of reading other accounts of paranormal or, paranormal or psychic interactions with them, I felt that reaching out to them in a psychic or intuitive manner was probably the only way to actually have a meaningful interaction with them. We traveled down Route 410, next to the White River, northeast of Mount Rainier, and found a beautiful area to set up a tent and camp next to the river. The area we set up our tent was pristine, clear, flat ground. This detail is important to the story, as you will see later, nestled within some majestic hemlock trees. It was about noon when we set up camp, and throughout the day I was trying to send a telepathic greeting with my mind, introducing myself and telling anyone that could hear me that I was a friend and wanted to say hello. I invited the Sabbath to come visit us, yet I did ask them not to scare us because I was trying to overcome my fear of them. I set all this in my mental projections into the forest. All that day and into the early evening I would periodically send out these friendly messages, with some trepidation I might add. I felt nothing in return. I didn't sense anything unusual or odd. Everything seemed peaceful, and I had serious doubts that these messages were even being received. When evening came, we had dinner, enjoyed a nice campfire, and soon after set in for bed. My wife and son fell asleep almost immediately, and before I dozed off in my sleeping bag, I wanted to try one last time to send a friendly message. The whole day and evening, I had experienced no odd sensations or fearful feelings. Everything was felt peaceful. I started telepathically sending my last greeting for the night, and something very strange happened. It's very hard to articulate in words, but I'll do my best to describe it. I felt the sort of connection with something after about 20 seconds of my message. It was like being hooked up to a battery or something like this, as there was a very strong surge of energy, and I received a picture in my mind of a face. It looked like a typical Sasquatch face, and it was very intense. It started to communicate with me. Not in English words, but in feelings. It was so intense that it hurt my mind, and after about 10 seconds, I had to disconnect mentally. After it was over, I laid there in my sleeping bag in a sort of a disbelief. What the hell just happened? Was it really them? 
I just somehow make all that up in my mind? I laid there for probably 30 minutes or so having this internal debate with myself, wondering what it was. I did feel like there was a message coming back to me, but I did not understand it. After a long while, I ended up falling asleep. It's kind of weird. I wonder how you knew how to mentally disconnect from it when you chose. Sometime later in the night, I was suddenly woken by something. I didn't hear anything. I couldn't see anything because it was pitch black out. I lay there trying to listen to any possible noise or movement outside. I then felt and heard the top of the tent being pushed down from above. My wife and young son were laying right next to me, and I knew that they were still asleep and were not moving. I became petrified. My first thought was that it was a psychotic person outside my tent in the darkness. I did not instantly think it was a Sasquatch, but another human with some possible horrible intent. For some reason, I felt compelled to call out mentally to Sasquatch for help. With all my might, I shouted for a telepathic message for their assistance. Instantly, that intense connection happened again, and the face was there. But this time, the communication was understandable. It was kind of like a mental download at first. Somehow I understood that the one communicating with me was a leader of a clan of a tribe of Sabe that had heard my messages the previous day. The sense I got from him was that they were perplexed that a human had made contact with them in this way as they had never experienced a human reaching out like this to them before. Apparently they were intrigued and curious about this strange human. He told me, and it was a he, that they heard my request to visit and so they did. The clan wanted to come see the human who reached out in this way. This, of course, terrified me, but before I could adequately respond, this being said to me in my mind, we know that you are afraid and we think it is admirable of you to contact us in a friendly manner despite your level of fear. After that, I felt the pressure relieved off the tent and the being told me that I don't have to be afraid. One of them wanted to wake me up, but not by making noises. They just wanted my attention and not to wake everyone else up in the tent. I then felt this peace come over me and the voice said in my mind, we will watch over you and your family tonight, and you will be very protected, so rest well and thank you for your messages. The connection was broken at that point, and it was over. I heard nothing outside but the river in the distance. I laid there again, thinking to myself, did I just lose my mind? Did I just make all that up in my head? That had to be real, right? I honestly didn't know what to think about it, but still felt this great peace. I no longer had any fear whatsoever, and sometime after that, I ended up falling back asleep. That morning, I was the first to awaken with a full bladder, and I had to go pretty bad. I immediately thought about the events the night before, and again, did not know what to think about it. Was it real? Well, I quietly got out of my bag and unzipped the tent to get out. Standing up outside in the early morning light, I ended up gasping at what I saw. My gasp woke up my wife, and she said, What is it? What's wrong? All I could say was, look at this. So she got up, looked outside the tent, and directly to the east of the tent, about a foot away, was this trench that was dug into the ground. It was four inches wide, four inches deep, and about eight feet long, gouged into the ground, a straight line. My wife saw it and gasped herself. She said, that wasn't there last night. She was right. The whole area where we had set up the tent was clear and unblemished. It was why we had set up the tent in that location. Sometime during the night, this line was dug into the ground. There were no fallen tree branches or any logical way to explain the trench that was dug. I looked all around the area for any tracks or signs of anything, but there was nothing. I still have no idea that what, why that was placed there during the night. Was it a line of demar demarcation? A uh, do not cross this line? Was it a place there to help me realize that I did not make all this up in my head? I tend to believe that there was that, that that was the reason behind it. I told my wife all that had happened the previous night, and after seeing the trench for herself, she believed me. She told me later that previous evening that she felt like she was being watched, but discredited it. Disregarded it, sorry. My sharing this experience is not meant to try to convince anyone. All I know is that it actually happened, and I am, and was at that time, a very mentally stable, happy individual. It isn't easy to share these things publicly because I understand how it may seem to others who haven't experienced anything close to this. Psychic phenomena itself is ridiculed by most people, so how much more a psychic interaction with a damn so how much more a psychic interaction with a damn Sasquatch? Please keep in mind that since my earlier childhood encounter, I've had a life filled with unusual and psychic phenomena. 
I don't really know if I've if I gained this intuition from that childhood encounter or if I had that encounter because of my intuitive abilities. My grandmother was very psychic and my mother always believed that I also had received the same gift. I don't really know for sure. What I do know is that I tend to have strange experiences more than most people and I tend to sense these beings when they are near. Thanks, Steve, for allowing me to share this experience. Again, I'm not trying to convince anybody. I'm just sharing this to possibly help others who have had overly strange experiences with these beings and for them to know that they are not alone. Hopefully, my encounters will encourage others to tell their extra weird, savvy experiences, too, without fear of ridicule. we got one more here. My last encounter. Back in September 2016, I went on a solo hike on the Man Road Trailhead just south of the small tra town of Startup, Washington, next to the Skykomish River. It was an overcast day, and arriving at the trailhead, there were no other vehicles or signs or other hikers. When I started down the main trail, I felt pretty uneasy and had that sense that something wasn't right. I felt that they were around. It is a hard sensation to explain, but it is like the air is electrified and all your senses become heightened. Some people may call this sensation a pressure. That's what I call it. Even though I felt this way, I wanted to press on and spend some quality time in nature alone. I had stopped in an area that had recently been clear-cut and listened for several minutes. I definitely felt like I was being watched, and even though I was unnerved by this, I just did not want to turn around and go back. I continued to mentally project that I was a friend of the Sasquatch people and just wanted to spend time in nature and open my heart to whoever or whatever was observing me. I wanted to be an open book, and that although I consider myself a friend of the Sasquatch, I did not want to intrude upon them. I always feel that this is vital to be transparent and never try to hide anything from them, like an agenda to capture them on film or to gain evidence of their existence. In my opinion, they already know your intent and plan, so it's always best to be humble and transparent when venturing into the forest and lands, into their forest and lands. After sitting for a while projecting who I was and being transparent, I got up and continued, and continued on down the trail. After about a half a mile of walking, the trail turned to the south and started going uphill. The further I went up the hill, the more the air seemed electric or charged. I did not feel scared, but it did seem very odd and I was pretty weirded out over it. The sensation was growing until suddenly, in an instant, I realized that it was gone. Yet the same moment, everything seemed very different. The trail had changed instantly. One moment I was walking up the hill and the next moment the trail was level again and everything was different. That's when I realized that I was walking back the way I had just come and was next to the clear cut again, walking back towards the trailhead. I felt so discombobulated and confused as to what had happened. How did I get to this point and why was I walking back the way I had just come? I traversed at least several hundred yards from the last place I remember going up the hill. I just didn't make any sense. It just didn't make any sense. I stopped and sat down on a stump and tried to process what the hell was going on. The feeling of electricity in the air was gone, but I still felt very, very unnerved. After several minutes, I stood back up and started to walk on the trail again towards the hill where I'd just been. I felt fine physically, so I was hoping that there wasn't something wrong with my brain. As I started coming close to the part of the trail where it started going uphill again, I started having that, what I can only, dis only call flashbacks to what had just happened to me. I started remembering. I was walking up this hill and had just passed a small creek, feeling this crazy sensation of electricity in the air, and then all of a sudden, a large male Sasquatch stepped out onto the trail about 50 feet in front of me from the right side of the trail. It looked similar to the paddy from the Patterson Gimlin film, although it did not have any breasts. It was huge. Even from that distance, I could tell it was so massive, and I felt so incredibly small, even though I'm six foot two and 240. I walked onto the tr it walked onto the trail and turned to its left, looking at me, stopped and spoke into my mind, you do not see me. And I went into some kind of a trance, turned around and walked back from where I came. When all this came flooding back to me, I realized that I would be in danger if I continued up the trail where the encounter happened. I don't know how I knew that, I just did. At that point, I felt pretty terrified, I started back down towards the trailhead at a quick pace. I still felt like I was being watched and followed the entire time and my hair was standing on end. 
I had gotten to a point on the trail where it turned towards the parking area and I heard a noise coming from the thick patch of tall brush. It sounded like the chomping of teeth. Like if you chomped your teeth together really fast. I couldn't see anything and I had not heard any movement in the bushes at all. It totally freaked me out. I also smelt a very strong stench like skunk mixed with rotten food. This sound happened right next to me and I took everything I had to keep myself from running. After that, I cried out saying, okay, I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Sorry, I interrupted you guys. It felt like something was going down in those woods and I happened to walk into it, interrupting something. I believe they escorted me out all the way to the parking area, even though I saw and heard nothing else. Oh yeah. There also were new, no forest sounds of birds or critters at all. It was totally silent the whole time. But this is a normal occurrence in our area and you tend to get used to the silence of the forest here, or maybe it's just me. As I walked past the gate at the entrance to the trail, there was a young couple that had shown up and were walking towards me. As I got to my car, I stopped and said to the couple, I wouldn't go in there if I were you. They both stopped, looked at each other, and looked at me and said, what? What do you mean? I don't know what to tell them. What do I say? There are Sasquatches in there and they don't want people around right now? They think I was mad. So I just said, well, you'll see. And I got in my car and drove away. Looking back now, I feel that that was irresponsible of me and I should have told them the truth. And to hell with being considered crazy. You were right, Steve. We humans are so afraid of what other people, other humans think of us. Today, I would not be afraid to say whatever I felt I needed to. But back then, I succumbed to my fear of ridicule. My thoughts. I spent many years thinking about these experiences and what they mean. After a lifetime of research and having had several experiences with these beings, I feel like I have more questions than I have answers. That the answers I feel that I have gained are to be held loosely in hand, because whenever you think you know what the hell is going on, something pops up to contradict or conflict with your hypothesis. I no longer hold on to anything regarding these beings in a dogmatic way. Personally, I, f I feel we still have no clue to the breadth and scope of who these beings are and what their true function is on this planet. Some researchers say that these beings are multidimensional and paraphysical in nature, and although I feel this is definitely close to the truth, I still think they are beyond our ability to really understand. We live in a 3D world, yet these beings seem to almost, almost to be 4D or 5D in nature. I feel they serve a function here in our world in a way that we may never truly understand. And this is one of the reasons why information on these beings is suppressed and kept secret from the authorities of governments around the world. They do not fully understand either, and this is why they must suppress knowledge about them. They cannot control the situation, and so if they cannot control the situation and its information, then no one will. At least that is the narrative that they seem to be pushing. This is one of the reasons why the Sasquatch community, generally speaking, believes these beings are an unclassified ape or something along those lines. That information is allowed to be propagated throughout the world because it is wrong. Those who have had a hand in the narrative of the human race want these beings to be something average or nominal because they cannot control them. If they cannot control them, then they will do all they can to openly discredit them and secretly destroy them. This may be one of the reasons why the big names of the BF community are used, willingly or unwillingly, in the tracking down and the killing of these beings. I am hopeful that your project, Sasquatch Confirmed, or whatever you decide to call it, changes this narrative and directs us in a way where we can not only grow and understand them, but also grow and understand ourselves. Why did the Sasquatch I saw on the trail put me in a trance to turn me around? He could have done many other things, including just letting me pass on, by without re revealing itself, but it didn't. It could have easily screamed at me and chased me out of the forest, but it didn't. It could have easily killed me or made me disappear, but it didn't. Why? I believe they have a reason in what they do for the most part, even if it is something far beyond our comprehension. It has been postulated by some researchers that Sasquatch people are connected to portals or doorways and that they may have an ability to come in and out of the invisible portals into our world. I tend to feel that these intelligent beings are guardians of these doorways or portals and may open naturally depending on many different factors. The Earth's geometric, geometric position in relation to the sun or a myriad of other factors. And that these doorways remain open for periods of time. 
Could it be that when these unseen doorways open, and these beings stand guard around them, and if humans get too close, they are frightened off or turned around? There is just so much that we don't know. There is much I'd like to discuss with you, Steve, especially as someone who is not a part of the Bigfoot community and does not buy into the specific camps or ideologies regarding these incredible beings. I no longer have friends within that community, mainly because, to some degree or other, most researchers feel they have at least some things figured out, which to me is a joke. Even those who claim to have intimate spiritual and psychic connections with specific Sasquatch beings and have written books in this context seem to contradict each other and, to some degree, act like they are ambassadors for the psychic Sasquatch beings. If these people are truly ambassadors of the Sasquatch people, then why do they differ from one another? I'm not a skeptic, and I'm not out to prove or disprove anything in this er arena anymore. But I cannot help questioning things even from these self-proclaimed ambassadors of the Ancient Ones or the Sasquatch people. I just, I just try to not, I just try not to drink any of the Kool-Aid that is passed around in that crazy community. I do think that as far as humans go, most who get into the research aspect of this phenomena become easy prey to hidden agendas and subtle ideologies. It is hard to remain unbiased and walk the razor's edge of being able to hold on to information without grasping it and making something out of it. It doesn't make friendships, that's for damn sure. When I share an experience like I did above, people tend to want to fit that information into their boxes. They want to color it within the context of their presuppositions. If they are Christians, they have to fit it into their ideological box that is formed from their religious dogma and theological indoctrination. They have to fit in it into their pre-existing box. If it doesn't fit, then it's either a lie or it is demonic and of the devil. <clears throat> Yet this is just one example. It is much harder to allow the information to point its own picture even if we don't understand it or it contradicts our world views of pre-existing ideologies. If these experiences that I have had have taught me anything, it is to not build constructs or firm ideas about them. They have taught me not only to be a free thinker, but also to not drink the Kool-Aid no matter how enticing it may be. One la- I don't know what that was. One last word about Sasquatch researchers and the Sasquatch community. Researchers, generally speaking, want to create a name for themselves. <laughs> Do they ever? The research or investigation groups are popular. Their work and efforts need to matter. Many people are clamoring for the, trops, for the top spots and to be recognized for all the study, research, and investments they have put into this endeavor. When you have hundreds, if not thousands of people who are seeking recognition and to claim you end up getting a giant shit show of narcs... <laughs> Sorry, let me start that again. When you have hundreds, if not thousands of people who are seeking recognition and to claim, you end up getting a giant shit show of narcissism, cult-like behavior, and even psychopathy. It becomes harder and harder to smell your own bullshit. Humans trying to get on top of other humans backbiting, slandering, trying to be the bigger and better than the other guys, a truly toxic environment, psychologically, physically, and spiritually. The Sasquatch slash cryptid community is a very toxic place. Many researchers deal with each other within this toxic environment and then go out into the forest trying to make contact with these powerful psychic beings, and they wonder why these beings want nothing to do with them. Some researchers will spend 20 years in a known Sasquatch hotspot but will have zero interaction with them, and they scratch their heads and ask to why. And, at, and they scratch their heads as to why. I think, generally speaking, most humans seem toxic to the Sabe. Most humans do not believe in our natural psychic abilities that we all have. If you don't acknowledge our innate physical abilities, then most people have no idea that there is such a thing as what I like to call psychic hygiene. Most people have no idea what they can be phys that they can be physically filthy, especially those who are neck deep within the toxic Bigfoot communities. Oh. Psychically, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. The sun's in my face here and it's snow around me. The, the um, glare is really screwing me up. 
most people have no idea that they can be psychically filthy, especially those who are neck deep within the toxic Bigfoot communities. If people really want to make contact with these beings, they need to learn how to reconnect with their intuition, exercise it, and clean their own personal psychic energy. Then, their chances of making contact with these psychic beings, I believe, dramatically increases, if that is something you really want. Yet, from my experience, once you learn about psychic hygiene and how to cleanse your heart, mind, and energy, then your ambitions for proof and answers tend to fall to the wayside. That was my experience. Imagine how different things would be if those who were dead set on being researchers and gaining evidence and recognition were to let it go, recognize that their intuition was a real and important thing, began psychic hygiene practices and brought more peace into their lives. Imagine how it would change things. People would stop listening to the big names of the so-called Sasquatch community and start listening to their own soul. Oh my god, you couldn't have said it any better. I think the Sabe would probably have more respect for us, for cleaning ourselves up and letting go of our own bullshit. Maybe we wouldn't get real answers from them because it seems to me they obviously do not think humanity on the whole is ready to understand who and what they are and what they are really up to in the wild places. One thing is for sure, there is a hell of a lot going on that we are kept in the dark about. Not just from our governments, but from them. If Missing 4 and one is telling us anything, it's telling us that there are a lot of mysterious things going on and we are left out of the loop. I tend to think we are left out of the loop because we just are not able to understand and that most likely our capacity to understand is directly related to our intuitive development and our own personal psychic hygiene. Maybe, just maybe, we need to start learning through our intuition and not just from logic and reason alone. If they really are multidimensional beings, then we need to stand, start understanding with more than just rationality and dogma. Our intuition is able to go beyond this 3D reality and maybe our puzzle that we're trying to piece together has a lot more to do with intuition and mere logic and reason alone. I turned 50 this past year and I feel like I'm just beginning to understand the importance of this gift. This gift has taught me that we are multidimensional beings as well and we need to keep our psychic house clean. Our sixth sense is where it's at and maybe the Sasquatch people are leaving clues for us in order for us to hopefully mature and grow in this manner. Maybe this is one of the reasons why the woo encounters or psychic experiences that people have with these beings have been sanitized and hidden for all these years. I try to keep humanity from growing their intuition. Oh, sorry. To try to keep humanity from growing their intuition and cleaning their act up. Toxic people and suppressed intuitions are much easier to control and manipulate. This world is a shit show. The Bigfoot community is a concentrated pool of human toxicity. I think we need to clean ourselves up and start walking in our natural, intuitive powers first before the world can be cleaned and straightened up. We have to become responsible for ourselves. I like to call this psychic sovereignty. We need to stop looking out there for our answers and start looking within ourselves. This is what I really think many of the direct and indirect Sasquatch encounters are pointing to if the stories and the experiences of others shared are undulated, undiluted sorry, are undiluted and unsanitized. They tend to be incredible experiences and many of them are weird and spooky. Maybe our experiences with them tend to have paranormal, unusual, or psychic aspects in order for us to face our own paranormal, unusual, or psychic aspects. Aspects. If someone has a terrifying encounter, maybe that experience should be looked upon as a therapeutic event in disguise, like hard medicine forced down our throats. Do we accept it and grow from it, or do we let it debilitate us and take away our love and need for the wild places? Can we look upon our terrifying encounters with different eyes? Can we use these experiences to further our own personal growth, or let it be poison to our minds and hearts? I think we have a choice in all of our encounters, to choose to see these experiences as a gift instead of a curse, as an, as an avenue to growth and understanding ourselves deeper instead of seeing our encounters as the nightmare and as a nightmare and debilitating us. These are the lessons I am learning from my own encounters. I hope it sound like I'm preaching here. That's definitely not my intent. I just think that many, many people are traumatized from their encounters with the Sabe and haven't really been shown a way to face their experiences 
in a way that can help them and grow from the experience instead of looking for answers from the shifty BFRO or from other Sasquatch experts in the BF community at large. I think it is much more beneficial to look at our experiences with different eyes and gain from them directly. Use our experiences with them for our betterment instead of our imprisonment to fear. It's taken me a long time to wrap my head around my, ter my terrifying experience as a child, and I now feel it has been a great blessing to my life. There's been a trial to have to deal with, and I keep, and I have kept having encounters, I think, to force me to deal with my own bullshit and overcome my fear. It has forced me to look into my own psychic intuitive abilities and what it all means. That's really what I want for others who have had encounters, especially traumatic ones. The Sasquatch community is filled with hurting, scared, and earnest people who want answers. I believe it's time to stop looking at other people as leaders and experts because there really aren't any. I know I'm not, and anyone who acts like they are, you need to run the hell away from them. This is why I am hopeful for your work, Steve. You are not you are not a Sasquatch expert. You're just like the rest of us, and you're making something that is really helping people. Sharing the undiluted, undiluted facts about these incredible and sometimes terrifying beings has the potential to actually help us all. And to do this, I'm very grateful. Thanks for listening to my long-ass email. I wish you all the best, my friend, and hope life continues to bless you. Love you, brother, your friend, and with much gratitude, John Blatt. Okay, I got a personal note here. I'll read that in a second. Um, what was he going to say to that so much? Because I'm reading, I'm trying to read steadily to you guys. I'm trying to take it all in at the same time. I'm, I'm reading it and I'm trying to, and it's igniting my brain to start thinking about things as I'm reading it. You, you describe the Bigfoot community as a whole basically bang on, obviously. We don't need to touch on that. But uh, what's one thing I, I think I have been sharing lately, as I've mentioned a few times, is for people, I even set out a challenge to a group of people who have been in contact with these beings. I'm like, hey man, if you guys are that good, which I believe you are, to have been, you know, to stick to it and dig and dig and dig and, and learn and learn and learn and, and, and make contact, then what I was hoping, possibly, maybe, that same group of people would probably get quite a ways if they were to look into who we really are, Right? what we are really doing we need people to do that focus on who the hell we are what we knew how to do what we probably possibly know how to do but we don't right i am 100 percent convinced before i read this that we need to figure out our own shit before we can understand other shit to put it in a easy simple kind of rough kind of way we need to learn about ourselves, man. And like you said about leaders, people claiming to be some kind of a leader authority. Pfft. Run, 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 run. Or if you have to, fight them. One or the other. <laughs> but don't give in and join them. It's proven a million times it's not a good thing. Those character traits, the need to be authority, the need to be in control, the need to be the one, is very, very terrifying, can be terrifying and scary human characteristic, right? It needs to be fought. It needs to be fought and squashed, as far as I'm concerned. But I couldn't hear, I kind of heard either a couple of bangs or a couple of gunshots that way while I was reading this. The other microphone picked up, maybe didn't, whatever. But I guess my truck should be cooled off enough to start driving again. But I have a funny feeling by the time I get out of here, I'm going to have to stop and do this again. To let my damn truck cool off as I make my way home to make shares even though at this current time YouTube is not letting me do anything. I'm in jail. So I'll talk to you guys shortly. John, please email again. That was a hell of a share. I appreciate it, man. You're full of knowledge. Knowledge that I'm after. I love hearing it shared. And believe me, you're helping a lot of people. So if you feel compelled, do it again. Email us again, alright? Be safe out there. We'll talk to you guys shortly.